Now we head to Newark International Airport, where an American-Iranian engineer was arrested while trying to smuggle secret documents to Iran. Mozaffar Khazai, a former U.S. defense contractor, uh, he's an employee, was arrested on January 9th after the first leg of his flight to Tehran via Germany. He was carrying documents that included uh, blueprints for the coveted F-35 multi-role fighter jet, which Israel is set to receive in 2016. Now this is the F-35, the most expensive fighter jet in the history of warfare. It costs the U.S. government $400 billion to develop and is meant to replace the majority of U.S. military aircrafts. Israel had pre-ordered 19 of them for about $2.5 billion. Chazai was naturalized in 1991 and was charged with, quote, transporting, transmitting, and transferring in interstate or foreign com commerce goods obtained by theft, conversion, or fraud. Now, this wasn't the first time Chazai tried to smuggle documents to Iran. In November, he was, uh, uh, or I should say, he actually did send a shipment from Connecticut to California with the intention of it reaching Iran that he said contained books and college-related items, two suitcases, a vacuum cleaner, and some other items, but it actually held quote, thousands of pages contained in dozens of manuals, binders relating to the F-35 program. Joining us to discuss this and more is Ali Gharib, a journalist focusing on U.S. security and Middle East affairs. Uh, Ali, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to have you. Obviously, this story, uh, pretty obvious as to perhaps why Iran or someone in Iran might want this intelligence, but what did you make of it when you heard of it? Uh, it it's just kind of pretty standard spying, you know, on military hardware and trying to get that information, especially because it's going to go to Iran's regional, uh, one of Iran's regional arch nemeses, Israel. But, uh, so that's not that surprising. What's sort of surprising about it is just that uh, the timing is a little bit aw awkward since, you know, Iran and the United States are involved in these really delicate negotiations. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear, uh, none of the news reports said that whether there was any obvious uh, ties between Khazai and the government, but it seems pretty clear that this was like government level spying and not um, yeah, not he, some kind of uh, like like freelancing information collection. Yeah, he wasn't sharing this information with his buddies back in Iran, yeah, meeting right. his friends just to look at this. Well, you know, it's also interesting that the F-35 has been actually very troubled in terms of like how much it's been, you know, how much money has been spent on it. Over cost, I, right. over budget, late delivery. I mean, this, um, this video looks fantastic. You know, this is put out by Lockheed Martin, but there were also some, some glitches with, with the operations and, you know, how it worked. Um, I don't know the nitty-gritty, but to your point, uh, Ali, you were talking about the timing of this, you know. There's also the timing of Rouhani's tweet, um, which many people were talking about yesterday. It's right here. We have it. This was actually uh, tweeted out by President Rouhani that the world has surrendered to Iran in the recent negotiations in Geneva. Um, what do you think this is about? I mean, is this about Rouhani needing to appease some of the hardliners back home? Yeah, it's, it's feather puffing for the domestic audience. Uh, it's also kind of ill-timed, and Rouhani, this, this is sort of not the kind of typical language that he dabbles in, which makes it all the more extraordinary that he's kind of taking this step to, to, uh, to appease his hardliners back home. Usually he takes a much softer line publicly, especially on his English language Twitter feed, which is run by right. officials close to him. And so it seemed to just kind of uh, be a little bit of an FU to America on behalf of his, his critics back home. And then he fell into this trap that, you know, like, as, as Twitter users, yeah. you and I know, you just don't delete tweets. He like, the cover-up's always bigger than the crime. Right. It's not that big a deal, and then it turned into this thing where people asked about it. And actually, the White House said, it's domestic politics, and he's doing yeah. this for his audience back home. Yeah. We're not surprised. And, you know, the AP came out and explained the reasoning behind that. Uh, of course, though, after he deleted it, it did get somewhat more play. I mean, here we are talking about it. And more importantly, some of those uh, senators who've been pushing for more sanctions, as you know, um, are trying perhaps to use this to their advantage? I mean, is that just a perception? Can they actually? Does it, I mean, does I mean they it, look, they try and use everything to their advantage, you know, and, and the Iranians are going to have slip ups like this. It's what they do. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Jeffrey Goldberg came out with an interesting column yesterday opposing these sanctions. He's a, he's a pundit who writes for Bloomberg mm -hmm. View. And, um, and he said, you know, he's a little bit hawkish on this, but he opposes these new sanctions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some of the sort of uh, right-wing people who work with these senators trying to pass sanctions mm -hmm. 
were badgering him on Twitter and saying, look at all these stuff these did. You know, the Iranian foreign minister laid a wreath at the grave of, of Imad Mughnia, mm -hmm. who is kind of the uh, a, a head for Hezbollah military operations, like a pretty ruthless terrorist. And, um, and, and so this, this people were badgering Jeffrey Goldberg with this stuff. And he said, you know, they've got politics there too. And that's, that's kind of the point. They have politics and they're really shitty politics, but they have politics and they've got to deal with them too. And so far, you know, uh, wreath, terrorist wreath layings and, uh, and triumphant tweets aside, yeah. they've been doing a pretty good job of walking that delicate line between engaging in serious negotiations, getting this interim agreement with the U.S., right. getting the implementation agreement, and going into these comprehensive talks and, uh, and, and being able to beat back a lot of their criticism back home. So, you know, they're, they're, they're working at it, and it's, it's, a, it's always going to be a dance, but... Right. But it's moving forward. A delegate dance. Well, speaking of a dance, a political dance, perhaps. I mean, you wrote this uh, this great piece in Haaretz, um, and you said if the U.S. Senate sanctions uh, bill ends up triggering hostilities between the U.S. and Iran, there will be bad times ahead for the pro-Israel groups pushing sanctions and their Democrat uh, Democratic supporters. Why? I mean, it's perhaps obvious as to why it would be bad times ahead. But I mean, how likely is that to happen? It seems as though it's unlikely that the bill is going to pass. Uh, I wouldn't go that go far. That far. Well, mean, you know more, so that's good. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a betting man. Um, but I and and I certainly wouldn't bet on this because who knows where things are going to go? You know, anything could happen. Uh, it doesn't like it's look like it's going to move in the next couple of weeks, but that's not you know yeah. like what the, it, early February wouldn't be a huge difference. And what about although the it is for the supporters of the bill? Mark Kirk came out and said that. If, uh, if we wait to enact these sanctions until early February, it would, it would be just like giving up Czechoslovakia to Nazi Germany. What a, like a, what a, a reference. A two-week delay. Yeah. 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 Everything is Munich. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think, but, I think it is happening, though, this divide among Democrats. You know, there's been this effort, especially by sort of the right-leaning and right-wing pro-Israel groups, mm -hmm. to constantly badger Democrats into these positions that aren't really good liberal positions. Mm -hmm. And that's starting to backfire, and, and the partisan divide on Israel is manifesting itself in a split among the Democrats. Mm -hmm. You have the, the Chuck Schumers of the world, the guys who are going to kind of always going to be in the pro-Israel column, right. in the like traditional pro-Israel column. Mm -hmm. And then you have groups like Americans for Peace Now and J Street that are working really hard on the Hill to open up space for Democrats to take more progressive positions on Israel. Mm -hmm. And these aren't, mind you, anti-Israel positions. And then on top of that, you know, as I detailed in this Haaretz story, yeah. you have this history over the past couple of years of Bibi's interference in the elections on the side of Mitt Romney and of the Jerusalem platform fight at the, the Democratic Convention where, you know, the Democratic grassroots, the delegates there, booed the idea, this like constant pro-Israel talking point that Jerusalem right. is a unified city, and now it's manifesting itself in Iran sanctions. And, and very quickly, the senator's saying that this indicates that the U.S. wants regime change. What do you make of that? Uh, Dianne Feinstein said that in a really amazing and strong speech pushing back against these new sanctions. I mean, it was quite something. There's, you know, she said that the, Israel can't tell us when to declare war and that she was, she was sympathetic to their needs, but they couldn't do that. And, that uh, and just said, you know, basically took up the administration's line that they've taken some crap for and said, look, if we don't get this diplomatic deal, we are going to be put back on that path to confrontation and war and it's going to lead there. And it was re it's really uh, quite an amazing speech, and I think it's, it's, it's of a piece of this thing where Democrats are not going to be badgered into these uh, hardline positions, especially when the stakes are as high as war and peace.